Good evening. My name is, as he uh, just said a second ago, my name is Paul Kerbin. I'm a state representative from the 105th District. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I would, I'd first like to say thank you very much for the hospitality that you all showed me tonight, as well as uh, my assistant and some others. Um, the food was fantastic. Uh, the hospitality was just out of this world, so thank you very much. Um, before I get into HB uh, 1512, I just kind of want to, I just, I, I really want to shoot straight with you on this. Um, I'm a, I like to think, and I hope that I always remain a little bit different than maybe a lot of my colleagues in the House of Representatives, specifically on the Republican side. Um, I haven't always really been interested in politics. I began to get interested right about 2004. I served uh, for several years, four years active, and six years in the United States Marine Corps, and uh, State Representative. Stephen Weber here is here also, and a lot of people in the house don't know that we actually were in the same platoon for a little bit. Um, and we're, now we're on different sides of the aisle in the house, so, you know, it's, they used to fight with each other, now you fight against each other. So, uh, just a, a little humor. But right about 2004, I really began to become a lot more sensitive to things that people were saying and doing in government, um, because... <laughs> Like Representative Weber, you know, we experience some friends of ours that die overseas that, you know, they get in trouble, they come back, they're missing limbs and so on. And um, so when I heard some Republicans and Democrats saying I was for the war before I was against the war, like my, my whole thinking on all of that has changed uh, about 180 degrees. But I began to become more sensitive to things going on in government. So I went back a little bit in history and I read from some of our founding documents, specifically the United States Constitution. I read from the Declaration of Independence, and I started to begin to understand the whole purpose behind American government and how unique American government is. And if you were to go back to the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, this is what really draws all the principles of American government together and is really what makes us so unique. Because in the second paragraph, for the first time in the history of the world, somebody stood up against a king or against a dictator, and they said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. So from these principles in the Declaration of Independence, for the first time in the history of the world, somebody had acknowledged and used these principles to separate from an oppressive government. They used the principles of equality. They used the principles of equality under the law. They used the principles of freedom and liberty to say that governments are instituted to make sure not to give us our freedom or to give us our liberty, but governments are instituted really to protect our liberty. Because the Declaration of Independence, and, and there's a lot of people of faith in this room right now, and I think everybody might, might agree or might not agree, I'm not sure, but that the same God who has created us probably created us all with the same amount of liberty. Therefore, if another man wants to rule over us, by that logic, he cannot do that unless he has our consent. Because it's mutually beneficial for him to protect my liberty, and I can tell him how to do that, how to go about doing that. So that's what makes America very unique. And So this bill, this particular bill, HB 1215, um, the Civil Liberties Defense Act. Last year I introduced a bill, uh, House Bill 708, called American Laws for American Courts, and there was a lot of people that had um, problems with the bill. And I, quite honestly, I can understand why. In the aftermath of 9-11, um, I think the Muslim community has, uh, has had a, an unfair light shed on them from people in America. Not everybody, but some people, okay? Um, so I think that sometimes these things carry forward, and so when bills are introduced, I think that there's some states, some representatives around America that are introducing this bill maybe as a way to ban Sharia law, maybe as a way to ban the use or the application of foreign law altogether. This particular bill, the way that it's written, and, and this is backed up and verified in every section of the bill, the bill says that foreign law is not banned, Sharia law is not even mentioned in here, we're, we're talking about foreign law, and there's several different ways to apply this also, but this law is not banned. What this law prohibits is it prohibits our judges from applying a foreign law, any foreign law, but only if that particular law would deprive one of our citizens of one of their fundamental rights or liberties. For example, let's just say that two people entered into a contract to do business. Um, if they broke the con they might have it written into the contract that if this contract is violated, we're going to we're going to prevent the other person from ever being able to talk again. You, you don't have any more freedom of speech, okay? 
This is, this is kind of a, an extreme situation, but it's hypothetical to make my point. Well, our judge would go and look at that contract and say, no, 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 you cannot use that particular provision in this contract because that would deprive somebody of a liberty that is absolutely fundamental and inherent to them. If somebody were to, uh, if somebody were to engage in, uh, whether it was marriage law or um, religious laws, such as Sharia law, or, or, or I'm a Christian, my dad happens to be a Baptist preacher, so if, if he wanted to institute some kind of religious tenet in our church, that ultimately, if I broke religious law, would deprive me of a particular right or liberty, our judges in our court system could not apply that particular religious law because the end result would be somebody would be deprived of their liberty. Now this law does, this bill does say though that the judges can use foreign law. There are several places, and I think there's a lot of um, misunderstandings. For example, here's, here's the paragraph, it's kind of a bill summary that a lot of people were given. It says that this bill prohibits judicial consideration of any system of laws that does not exactly mirror the United States Constitution. But if you were to read Art Section 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, and Section 6, Paragraph 2 of my bill, it says that we can use foreign law. It doesn't have to exactly mirror the United States Constitution. Um, the second part of this paragraph that, that uh, people were um, using, it says, This bill would severely disrupt the delicate balance of church and state in cases where judges legitimately rule on marriage contracts or wills that are based on religious law. But in section 2 it says that the Missouri General Assembly fully recognizes the right to contract freely under the laws of the state. And in section 8 it says no court shall interpret this to limit the right of any person to the free exercise of religion as guaranteed by the First Amendment to the United States Constitution and the Constitution of this state. It goes on a little bit further to, uh, but it's a little bit redundant so I won't say it. HB 1512 violates the constitutional separation of powers by requiring judges who follow legislative restrictions on their ability to make legal decisions. That particular argument is actually quite moot because in, in, the, in our particular system of government, the judges actually are fully dependent on the legislature because the legislature is who sets policies. So when somebody, if there's a conflict between certain policies or in, in a statute, for example, it goes to the courts and the courts are supposed to make their ruling. So that particular argument... Um, it's not even really an argument. I can't say it's right, because, and I can't say it's wrong, because it just doesn't even apply at all. The bill would also violate both the Missouri and U.S. constitutional prohibitions on any impairment to contractual obligations by disallowing the voluntary agreement of individuals to abide. Basically, this is what it's saying. Even in contracts, even in our own, even in our own religious tenets, whether it's Sharia law or me as a Baptist or Catholicism or whatever you, or whatever you say, if somebody wants to apply a religious law, if somebody wants to um, use the religion, for example, in my church, if somebody uh, acts inappropriately in our church, our church can exercise church discipline and remove that person from our church, and they won't be allowed to participate in some of the things that we do because they've acted inappropriately maybe with some of the members. This bill says that that's fine, but if our church discipline, say, for example, would require that we have to confiscate their property or we're going to cut an arm off or a leg off or something, the judges in our court system would not allow us to use that particular application of our religious laws. Because at that point, we would be depriving somebody of life, liberty, or, or their property. So really, this, this whole bill, there's, there's a couple reasons why this bill, I think, has been extremely misunderstood. First of all, because the people that are really pushing for it, they're pushing for it in the sense of Sharia law. Um, the second reason is because somebody asked me one time if this included Sharia law, and I said yes, but not because it's an outright ban on Sharia law. I said yes because if, and I'm not an expert on Sharia law, but I'm just, I said yes because if there was something in Sharia law, maybe there is, maybe there isn't, I don't know, because I'm not an expert, right? But if there was something in Sharia law that would uh, uh, deprive somebody of life, liberty, or pursuit of happiness, well then of course Sharia law would apply. But the same thing would apply in my own church for our, for our own religious tenets. Um, this bill is designed strictly to protect the letter and the spirit of our laws, and it also allows for the application of foreign law. Um, the only way that foreign law cannot possibly be used in our court system is if it would deprive somebody of their freedom of speech, the right to worship freely, the freedom to assemble, such fundamental sacred liberties that America has a tradition of protecting here. Um, it, also at the same time that my bill had a hearing last year, there was another bill that had a hearing at the exact same time, and that particular bill actually used the word Sharia law to ban Sharia law, and I think that it, there was an unfortunate 
tagging of my bill to that particular bill. And so I think that there's been a lot of uh, misunderstandings about it in particular, and uh, which I think is really unfortunate. Thank you. Which I think is really unfortunate, but um, in America we haven't always used our founding principles to the best of their ability. But fortunately in America we have a system of laws and a constitution that allows us to continually seek out perfection using the principles of freedom and liberty. About three weeks ago I spoke at the St. Louis University School of Law. They had a special symposium and, and I, didn't, I didn't realize that the whole thing was about this particular bill. I thought I was just one. I thought I was just supposed to talk for five minutes. I got there. People had flown in from all across the country to talk about it all day. So I wasn't, wasn't prepared. It was kind of a humbling experience for me. But he, there was a, a, a Muslim man who was sitting right next to me, and I'm trying to remember where he was from. Maybe the Sudan. And uh, his story is, is that if he goes back, there are certain people there that are trying to kill him. So he came to America to escape that particular persecution. And I think it's fantastic that in America, and there's other countries in the world too, where people can go to escape persecution based on religion. In fact, America has a great history of this because our own story of pilgrims and, and other people that came to America, they were coming here to escape religious persecution. So even if there is somebody who's trying to persecute uh, members of their, their faith or members of their community for religious purposes or otherwise, you always have a sacred, safe haven that, to protect your freedom and liberty here in America. And uh, I have a little bit of a libertarian streak in me. And, and when I say that, I, I'm not talking about the Libertarian Party, I'm talking about this idea that we're all created to be free individuals. And in America, where we use the rule of law to protect us from tyrants or from persecution, that's something that we just need to make sure that we get back to right away, because I, I sincerely believe that every one of us here is created equal, and that we all have the same amount of liberty. I don't think anybody here has more of a right to speak freely than I do, and I don't think that I have more of a right to rule over anybody, maybe even represent the people in my district, than what they tell me that I have. I sincerely, sincerely believe in those founding principles, and um, I think that if somebody were to read this bill, that... Uh, that they would see that this bill really just backs up, reinforces, and solidifies those principles. But unfortunately, there's been a lot of misunderstanding out there about it. So thank you very much.